afternoon. My name is Dave Norton from Discovering New England History, and we're going to start a new series here. Uh, it's going to be on the John and Elizabeth Howland family. A little different perspective here. Um, instead of covering the entire, uh, all the famous uh, Plymouth fathers and whatever, we're going to go just by on this particular family, and we're going to be starting off certainly in. Um, in England, and we're actually going to be ending up in Riverside, Rhode Island. So I think you'll find it uh, a quite uh, a different perspective on the, uh, the Plymouth story. So we'll begin with slide one. And John Howland Gravesite, okay, he was one of the pilgrims. And it's located in Burial Hill, Plymouth, Massachusetts. And that's on the right, that's a picture of his uh, gravestone. And it's a great, if you've ever been there to Plymouth, it's up on a hill, and you can see in this picture here, actually on the left, you can see the harbor. So it's a very, very um, uh, great place to, uh, to study history and to study the, uh, the pilgrims. So that's John Howland. We'll go to the next slide. Then we're going to probably be finishing up in, uh, with Elizabeth Howland. And... Her gravesite is at the ancient Little Neck Cemetery in Riverside, Rhode Island. And that's a picture of it right there. And that's a close-up on the right of her uh, gravestone. And it's quite a, really quite a story. And I don't think uh, too many other, if any other, documentaries are on this particular, uh, particular family. So we'll go to the next slide. And it starts off uh, with William Bradford, his house in Austerfield, England. And William Bradford, that's, that's his uh, actual house, still there. And uh, he was uh, kind of against the Church of England and all the tyranny and everything that was going on in England at that time. And we'll go to the next slide. And... His friend, uh, William Brewster, quite a bit older than him, and he lived in Scrooby, England, and that's his, uh, you can see the size of the houses, they're, they're quite, uh, quite large, in England. So these are the two uh, folks that actually started the whole uh, Pilgrim story. We'll go to the next slide. Now, Elizabeth Tilly, now her first name was Tilly, uh, before she got married, and I found this one here in, in 1607. Uh, uh, that's when she was born in Bedfordshire, England. And that's a picture of the cemetery there, and there's the uh, church in England. And she's a big part of this story here, but at that time, in 1607, she was just born. We'll go to the next slide. And now, here's the two folks, William Brewster and William Bradford. And they both met and both went to the St. Helena's Church in Austerfield, England. It's about 150 miles north from London. And that's a picture of the church. And um, I, this whole history uh, means a lot to me because I'm a direct descendant of William Bradford. <laughs> And uh, my daughter got the, uh, in the Mayflower Society through, my, through uh, my side of the family. She traced it all the way up. So uh, this, this is a story that means a lot to me. We'll go to the next picture. And here's a picture of Scrooby Village where William Brewster lived. And you can see that's, a, um, that's what it looks like today. But that's a quite, uh, quite a nice village in a rural uh, part of uh, England. We'll go to the next slide. Now, his house, uh, what happened here in England, uh, the, uh, everyone had to, be, had to join and had to be a member of the uh, Church of England back in 1607, back in that time. And uh, it was very oppressive, and they had a lot of strict rules. So there was a group of uh, English and they call themselves the separatists. They wanted nothing to do with the Church of England. And they had to meet secretly uh, once a week for their church services. 
And that's where they met here in Scrooby, England at the William Brewster home. We'll go to the next slide. And during this time, Queen Elizabeth I was in charge of England and she was quite uh, ruled with an iron fist. And in 1603, her reign ended and King James I took, off, took over. Now, everyone hopefully, like the separatists thought, okay, King James now is in charge, things are going to change. And they actually changed, but for the worst. We'll go to the next slide. Now, these are the rules he had he put down as soon as he took over, 1608. Uh, number one, everyone must attend church services every week. That's everyone in England. Uh, secondly, no one can hold unlawful assemblies. So the idea of the separatists holding an assembly or a church service in the house was illegal. And then three, stealing is prohibited. And there were so many poor people at that time that uh, in order to survive, they had to, had to steal food off the streets. Now, the penalties uh, in, in succession here, uh, number one, you're imprisoned and tortured until you agree to conform. And after three months in prison at the Tower of London, you would be exiled if you didn't agree to conform. And if a couple of years later you returned to England and they found you, you would be executed. And if you were caught stealing, one or both hands were cut off. And that was the law of the land, the Church of England, across all of England. So we'll go to the next slide. And the Tower of London, all those that uh, broke the laws, that's where they ended up. And that's quite an imposing uh, castle, if you will. And we'll go to the next slide. King, King James I, of course. Uh, there's another, uh, another shot of the Tower of London. And that's the place where you, believe me, you did not want to get arrested and end up in there. And we'll go to the next slide. And that's a picture of one of the torture rooms. And you can, you can see it's down in the dungeon, down in the below ground level. And they used to torture all the prisoners relentlessly until they agreed to conform to all the rules and regulations of King James I. We'll go to the next slide. And you can see some of these uh, pictures here. Um, they carried this thing out. It, it was awful what they what they did to all these all these folks. And that's one of the reasons the separatists wanted to get away from the Church of England, start their own church, and have their own religious freedom. But they, because they were, uh, <clears throat> you know, assembling unlawfully, were persecuted, and those are the ones that. Um, uh, King James I were after. We'll go to the next slide. Now, there's a picture of, uh, this was an old, done in the old days, I guess, a nice sketch of the London Bridge. And King James I, in order to make sure his, all his rules were carried out, he wanted to make sure every single day there was a reminder of what could happen to you if you ended up in the tower of London. And if you take a look on the, on the right side at the entrance there of the bridge, you can see it's covered. There's a covered bridge, different sections. And you can see all these, um, looks like poles sticking up out of the, uh, over the top of the arch. What he did was everyone that was executed and beheaded, he would put their heads on each one of these poles. And then everyone that lived in London, going to work or going home, would come back and have to look at this. Just as a reminder, that was his way of uh, enforcing his laws. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, the separatists secretly, they planned leaving England in 1608. And they wanted the freedom of religion, get away from this tyranny, get away from this persecution, um, 
They, they, they just couldn't, couldn't handle that. And these are the four individuals we'll be talking about. William Bradford, I like to put the ages down so you get, a, get an idea of important, this time in history. Uh, William Bradford was 19 years old. William Brewster was 42. He's one of the, uh, the church elders. John Howland, that we're going to talk about, is 16. And John Carver is 43. Now, Bradford and Howland... Um, they were essentially uh, understudies uh, to each of these two older uh, church fathers. But they were important in forming this plan on how to leave England. And in order to uh, not get discovered when they had their church services on Sunday, you can't have 40 or 50 people all showing up and walking down the street to go to church. So every day during the week, groups of three or four would come and then they would stay over at William Brewster's house. And at the end of the week, they'd have the whole con congregation and then they would split it up that way. And it was so bad in England that the, the, <laughs> what they had is neighbors were turning people in if they didn't go to church. If you missed a church uh, one day a month, if you missed that church, uh, they would come after you. And your neighbors would turn you in. It was quite, quite an impressive uh, society back there. And so the, to get away from that, they knew that over in Holland, they wouldn't be religiously persecuted. And they wouldn't have this tyranny. And on the right, of course, there's the symbol of the, uh, an actual uh, wind, uh, windmill in Holland. We'll go to the next slide. Now, they all got together. And what they did is, over a period of time, they sold all their land, pooled all their money to try to get a ship, a Dutch ship, to uh, go across the North Sea over to Holland. And the first time they tried it, one of the uh, neighbors would ever turn them in. And William Brewster and the others were, were put in prison for a couple of months. And they, then they really said, we, we really got to get a better plan. We really have to do this. So they all got together again, tried it again. And this time they were uh, successful. So they sa sailed across the North Sea over to Holland to escape all the tyranny under King James I. And we'll go to the next slide. Now... Elizabeth Tilly, she was only one years old at the time, but she came over with her mother, her father, her aunt, and her uncle. And she came over with them. She was only one years old over to Holland. And John Holland at the time, he was 16. And there's a picture of the Mayflower. Actually, it wasn't the Mayflower. It was a, a Dutch ship that took them over to Holland on their first voyage. And they made this trip in 1608. They were completely penniless because they had to use all their money from selling all their property to pay for the uh, transportation. Let's go to the next slide. And there's Amsterdam, Holland. You can imagine they were really excited when they saw this, when they uh, came upon uh, Holland and, and left England for whatever. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, when they came there, they were kind of like, what is this place? <laughs> Amsterdam, Holland. I mean, it was, a, it was a big city. You can see that, all the hustle and bustle in the, uh, the town. And you can see this painting here. I mean, it was just crowded and uh, totally different. Because you got to remember, they were basically farmers living out in the countryside. And all of a sudden, they walked into this... Uh, big city environments. And we'll go to the next slide. And there's another picture in Amsterdam. Uh, now, Amsterdam now, there was no farming. It was a city, a city of merchants and tradesmen, and they were involved in the metal and leather factories. That's what they did. Uh, population of 240,000. I mean, it, it, this is amazing. Uh, the people from Holland dressed different than those of England. They, they, they talked different. Um, uh, the folks that arrived over there were completely penniless. And uh, 
they lived in a life of poverty, but they had complete religious freedom, which they enjoyed. And we'll go to the next slide. But this is what they left behind. And all their time in Holland, that's kind of in the back of their mind. That's what they dreamed about their life in England. You can see how beautiful it is, the open country or whatever. Uh, it's it just, this is just a great shot here. We'll go to the next picture. And there it is, there's their, uh, they had these villages here and then all the lands where they farmed and raised sheep and cattle were in the countryside. And we'll go to the next slide. And that's what they left behind. All this uh, pastures and everything where they used to, uh, used to go for walks and uh, it was totally different in Holland, but they did have, they weren't persecuted and did have religious freedom. So we've got our next picture. Now, they only lasted there in Amsterdam for 10 months to a year. And they really didn't fit in. Um, they didn't really have any of those skills to work in the industry, and they, they were just completely uh, lived in a life of poverty. And so they decided to move south to the town of Leiden in 1609. So that's about a year later. And there's Elizabeth Tilly. Of course, she was only two years old at the time with her parents and John Howland. And you can see that now, now you're into the areas where you've got a lot of canals and that's different, but it's not as congested as Amsterdam. So we'll go to the next picture. And of course, this is generally what people think about in Holland, uh, the, uh, the winters and all the canals frozen and ice skating. It, it was a totally different environment, totally different environment that they had to adapt to. And we we'll go to the next picture. And this is a great picture of the canal. It shows you how close together they had. In Ireland, it was a city, this was different. This was a city of weavers, the um, textiles, if you will. Endless canals, and they had to adjust to one room apartment living. <laughs> they had a life of poverty, but they did have religious freedom, which they were just really, really thrilled about. But you can see all of these are here, and they only had one room, and old families would have to live in one room, and it was just, uh, a life of uh, poverty. Whatever money they had, they had to spend it for food or for the um, to pay rent. We'll go to the next slide. And you can see the narrow streets. Narrow streets, it was an industrial location. Once again, no farming. And we'll go to the next slide. And this is a typical one-room apartment in Leiden, Holland, back in the day. Um, I mean, you can imagine living in England out in the open pastures and, and way out in the, um, that part of the country, and all of a sudden they're thrown into this. And um, they actually uh, stayed there for 12 years. We'll go to the next slide. And in Leiden, Holland, they, they, um, they had their congregation next to St. Peter's Church. And they had the Reverend John Robinson, he came over from England with them. They elected him as the church, uh, church pastor. And that's a picture of the church today. And that's a plaque that's on the wall of the church uh, honoring the Reverend John Robinson, uh, one of the original uh, Pilgrim Fathers. And he had his congregation, and they were very faithful, but they also lived in a life of poverty. You go to the next picture. And there's a close-up there of uh, uh, another plaque for John Robinson. And that's uh, an entrance where, where all the uh, pilgrims would gather in a small, cluster of buildings. And then we'll go to the next picture. And over on the right, today, that's, uh, that's the Pilgrim Museum in Leiden. But it gives you an idea of, um, you know, 
these one-room apartments totally different than if you're a farmer and you're used to the fresh air and staying outside. A, a totally different atmosphere altogether. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, if you can picture Elizabeth Tilly, now she was 13, but she still lives in a one-room apartment with her mother, father, and her aunt and uncle. And John Howland is now 28 years old, and he lived in one of these one-room uh, buildings with the, uh, the Carver, John Carver. Just to give you an idea um, what, they, what happened over here in Howland, in um, Holland. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, William Brewster. This is kind of, this is an excellent, excellent story. He was the elder pilgrim, and he was one of these small, small apartments. And look on the right, that's his, uh, that's his, uh, <laughs> that's his front entrance to his door in one of the alleys these, uh, to get in there. And that's his front yard, if you look at that, that's all. <laughs> And they used to call that uh, Smelly Alley because uh, there was no uh, sanitation, was poor. People would throw their garbage in the streets and uh, the farm animals would just roam the streets and everything. And it was just a terrible situation. And he was really getting impatient with this, this whole thing, this whole way of life. And um, so he decided to, uh, to take some action here. So we'll go to the next slide. And of course, I like to throw these slides in. This is what probably when they went to sleep at night, this is what they dreamed about. Here's what they gave up in England, open countryside. And now they're in a, another big city. And we'll go to the next slide. And amazing, huh? the, the different culture, the different uh, everything they had. And it's really just a memory. And now they were worried because, um, for instance, uh, Elizabeth Tilly was only one year old when she came over there, and now she's uh, 13. So she grew up over in Holland. And now they were concerned because they wanted to maintain their English culture as best they could, and not the Dutch culture. And of course, this generation now was becoming more Dutch than English. So now they, had a, they wanted to come up with a plan. We, we've, we've, um, <laughs> we've tried our living here for 12 years. Maybe there's a better option for us. And they really longed for getting back to England. But back in England, King James I was still there, and all his rules and regulations were still there. Which is, uh, which, is, which is some tough choices you had to make right here. So William Brewster, if you go to the next slide, this is what he decided to do. He bought a small, his own printing press. And back in, in the day, they would have, the, on the right, they would, they would have uh, uh, the machinery for crushing grapes to make wine. And of course, uh, with, with the, uh, the screw that comes down there and the pressure and all that, uh, with a somewhat of modification, because remember they were the farmers, but they were also good at uh, carpentry. They fabricated and made over time, very secretly, a printing press. And over on the left side of the picture is actually one of the original documents that they used to print. What it was is, uh, a f protest against King James the first, and they would print hundreds of these, hundreds of these secretly, and they would have them transported one person to another, all the way over to England, and that's where they distributed them. And he just kept on running this press. Now, what happened here was King James found out about this. What is going on here? All these pamphlets are going on. It's going against my rule, going against my regulations. So he had everyone on alert to try to find where this press was and who was doing it. And he did all his uh, investigating, and all of a sudden it started to lead him right to the town of Leiden, Holland. And once again, uh, 
they figured it was William Brewster. And so the separatists there in Holland, there's quite a few of them because you had, I had another generation. Um, <clears throat> in order to protect him, what they did is every night he had to stay in a different apartment. <laughs> they moved him around from apartment to apartment and back to a, back around again. Um, and now, but now it was getting over in uh, Holland, it was getting very oppressive now because now the Dutch were cooperating with the English and they wanted to find that printing press and who was doing it. So it was really, really, now you're getting into some, some really uh, uh, almost the same situation that they had when they lived in England. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. And so they left Leiden, secretly left uh, Leiden, Leiden, and went to another town, Delfshaven, which is in southern Holland in 1620. Now it's 1620. So they spent 12 years in Holland. <coughs> and here's a picture of uh, Delfshaven. It's a beautiful town. And they were going to once again pull all their money and get a ship. And what they wanted to do was sail a ship and purchase another ship from England and go across the ocean to America. And that was their whole, uh, whole object. And it was quite, uh, quite a scheme. So on our next episode, we're going to cover that whole trip and uh, once again, it's Dave Norton, Discovering New England History. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.